Hunter x Hunter episode 110. Look at this team. The Chikai Hokara Juni. Denguchimo, Gyokzano Manimuka, the Chikakura Tiru. Oof, wild. No going back now. How many of them are gonna panic? Like on first entry. We this stairwell, man, it's a villain of its own. I can't wait to see Moral's reaction to it, actually. There's such a long build-up with Moral and Nav, and their reaction to seeing the retreating Gonin Kalua. We've seen Nav encounter it, we haven't seen Moral encounter it. I mean I expect he'll get over it. I guess it also might help that they're not alone. Gonin Kalua have the benefit of having already experienced it, and they've been thinking about it this whole time. It's just so cool that the Royal Guard is so badass that the stairwell leading to them is its own enemy, its own villain. Confusion X and X expectation. Also a lot of build up on like how much can we predict about this what does this mean what does this mean we all sama will not be giving you any rewards click click where is she where's pam Oh man, they all know about your basement. That was a lie. I feel like it's gonna be a lot of take. You too? I found it. He, he totally panicked. It was such a real moment. And panic. He hid the body, but not his shoes. Oh no, they're gonna. Oh no, they're dangerously, dangerously close to figuring this out. This is an opportunity for someone who wants to move up the ranks. It'll lead him to the stairwell. Oh no. Things have gotten a little bit awkward. Right, I had it wrong last time. He does have a name, he just never heard it. Why does their bond feel so real, despite it being basically chess as the sole extent of their interactions, besides the eagle incident? The question he asked himself about who's moving my pieces or am I able to move my own pieces just becomes cooler the more I think about it. Freedom is not in opposition to rules or objective structure or there being things that you can't control. In fact, you probably need those things to be free. There are just things that are bigger than us. So the question of freedom is not like, do I have control over everything? Because you don't. It's more, more like, how can I harmonize what is true? What is myself? What am I really in relation to that? And then given those parameters, how do I play optimally? Am I playing at the highest level? Am I choosing my own pieces or is something else choosing for me? The two of them are playing this game, but on some level that probably is unconscious to them, they're engaged in this game of life together. One of the reasons why Kamugi feels strong in their interactions and the king feels weak is because Kamugi is not trying to force anything that is not controllable to her. Like, Gungi is just Gungi, and she's mastered how to move her pieces, the most controllable, actionable thing, things she actually has agency over, with full peaceful acceptance of the rules of the game. Where the king is not always playing Gungi. He plays ego games. He tries to threaten her into submission, tries to intimidate her. Outside of the game, tries to rewrite the truth for himself to make himself feel better when the truth is the truth that he can't ignore, which is why he couldn't bring himself to kill her and why he got so upset about that bizarre eagle attack. As I've said previously, I think maybe this is one way to conceptualize villains and heroes as a whole. Villains are those that are unable to accept the truth. Villains can't cope with it, cannot break through what initially is a like a painful barrier of truth to like a higher form of beauty and instead try to threaten it or destroy it or what have you. Sort of showcasing the the best possible pathway for someone encountering these sort of difficulties as this whole group of assassins comes to the palace to try to kill him. How we doing? <laughs> we are really <laughs> zigzagging here. <laughs> But it feels positive. I feel like a lot of times growth looks repetitive if you're only evaluating it on one axis. It's kind of like a pendulum swinging on a spaceship. Like if you're in the spaceship, you just see the pendulum swinging side to side, but it's never actually occupying the same physical space twice. You revisit the same poles, multiple times, but like each time it's a little bit more refined. You're working through it. You know, you're playing sort of hot and cold with the truth. Also about what he just said about boredom. I think that's one of the catches of these big things people aspire to like fame. It plants the seed of its own destruction because you imagine it to be you getting the esteem of the people that you want esteem from. But typically I think no matter how high you move up a certain type of ladder, you still are yourself and you know you're yourself and you don't feel that much different. So people treating you differently has a way of sort of invalidating their opinion. Like, oh, they just don't know. <laughs> you know, they don't know that I'm just a human being. And 
and that kind of saps the utility from what their attention gives to you. I'm guessing that just about everyone has had this experience where you encounter someone and for whatever reason, they end up adoring you. But you also get the distinct sense that they don't really know you and they don't really love you. They love some story they've made up about you that doesn't match your vision of what you actually are. To the king, I think that actually would be poofy. But imagining that state, how much does that person's adoration really mean to you long term? Like how much does that do for your life satisfaction? Now imagine that with just a lot of people whose names you don't even know, who like rush you and want to touch you and want you to write your name on a piece of paper for them as if that means anything to you. That probably gets more lonely the more that scales. It starts to seem ridiculous. I think adoration is really powerful and works really well when you feel like the people actually love you for you and know you for you. This sort of mindless puppet thing, maybe it's going to be really fun at first, but I think ultimately it's vacuous. And yeah, boring. It's a volatile time in the king's life. You asked for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's a slapping. That's a tail whipping. She's, I feel like she's the best at handling it. Is that because she cares at least? I mean, I know she cares. She's a royal guard. She seems to have the most healthily detached role. Like, she enjoys other things about her life. Whereas Yubi, in contrast, is all wound up. She doesn't feel afraid of him at all. そう、だ、グルスフォール。私の能力。スピリチュアルメッセージならば。Oh、what I want to see a whole episode of just Yuppie's thoughts, honestly. Not to turn this into a fanfic, or to turn this into one of those Hawks Endeavor fan comics I saw in Akihabara, but there's something very, like, romantic about it, though I guess this could also apply to some friendships. And I'm still holding out to see the full picture, but this is sort of how it's hitting me now. Sometimes when you fall in love with someone or date someone, maybe you do actually connect with and recognize some of the really amazing qualities of that person and see them for who they are. However, sometimes there's also a part of it where you meet someone and you immediately form a narrative of how it would change your life, what it would mean for you to have someone like that. You take some of the reality that you see, and you, speaking of fanfics, write one, you write a Disney love story where you are made into something that you're currently not and don't know how to become on your own just by virtue of being connected with that person. It's sort of this validation trick where if someone like that loves me, I must be of this value, which of course is a trap because dating someone cannot itself imbue you with value in any way that really matters. One of the many dangers of it is that you're now attached to a narrative you've created about that person that may or may not be who or what the person is or what they will become because they're people and they're changing and growing. And so very quickly, you end up rooting against what could be growth from the person you're with or the person you're in love with because their growth is a damaging force for your narrative that you now need to maintain this new level of value you're trying to hold on to. I mean, I think this is sort of why I'm dancing around talking about Yuppie and talking about Neferpedo and how they hit me differently. They're both in service to the king. She is who she is. And then like, she also is in service to the king. Yuppie is so tightly, intricately woven with this very specific version of the king that he idolizes and thinks is the highest thing and defines himself in service to it. And with that comes a tremendous fear of the truth of what a person is. That song, Love Fool by the Cardigans. It's okay to lie to me as long as you tell me you love me, but it's nasty because you can feel it. You still know, even if you don't want to. Oh, sorry, I may have called him Yupi. I meant Poofy. That would be good to know. Yeah, you should probably send out a memo or something. I love how the bruises have become part of his design. Yeah, 
I thought My Little Pony would be relegated to the role of a lackey, but actually he's one of the biggest threats to this plan right now. Also, the more I watch of Yuppie, he actually seems like a kind of nice <laughs> general, as weird as that is to say. His personality doesn't match his image necessarily. So far. This is gentle Yuppie. Everyone in the show is a master detective. Part of that is true. I just want to get back to my dungeon. This is out of left field, but I'm going to critique the king's management style. It's something I've experienced in real life. Like, the king has this way of punishing you either way, which creates a disincentive for people to be upfront. They just avoid. People compartmentalize their own problems. People stop communicating. The king stops getting the truth. And the same is true probably for the royal guards and the underlings. There's like a communication breakdown here. Tied in with this is this problem they've touched on earlier, which is like the only acceptable outcome is perfection. Well, as soon as that's the framework, you've lost. It then becomes about like putting makeup over all the problems, hiding all the problems. With a different framework, my little pony would just alert all of them to this immediately. <laughs> right, what's he getting at? What does he want? What's the game plan? Take the credit? It's, you discover the plot? Let him take the fall if you don't? I know I would be. Then can I go back down to my dungeon? Okay, Hakya. We've sort of been down this road. Oh, here we go, here we go. Do you say goodbye? What, what do you say? It's very kind, you should probably push your limits. Smell. Yeah. You gotta give at least an hour. Well, that's tough. This is not a great time to quit for your nerves. <laughs> Quitting smoking is hard without taking on a giant ant king <laughs> in an almost certainly fatal encounter. People relapse on addiction because they miss their bus. That's a great help. Thank you. It's a little bit disheartening that they're still bickering about this at the last minute. Unless it was the king's order. Lay down the hammer, moral, and knuckle. Okay, maybe it's a good sign. Oh. <laughs> I like this theory. I like that they're getting it wrong, finally. <laughs> um, wow, that just... <laughs> Amazing how they just rattled all of them. They thought they had come to terms with every possible angle. Palm and the king, it would be a lot to take in. Now, thankfully, absent for this conversation. Wait, what if it's true, though? <laughs> also, wait, haven't we established that Gon does know? All of those older women on Whale Island? <laughs> You don't want to walk in on that. The unexpected make up the majority of what's possible. <sighs> Conflicting feelings because you don't want to trust going to stay focused, but it's Pito. Yeah, right, right. You're not going to prepare for this now. All the preparation has to have been in the past. And we wouldn't want that. I think you have to go into this not thinking about certain things. <laughs> He's right. Well, like, I don't know, it's weird. It won't ruin their plans. Kalua can't anticipate this. It helps them, maybe. It creates really weird moral quandaries for them going in, gearing up to just murder what they expect to be tyrannical, cold killing machine ants. Gotta be shirtless for this. Finally! 
Wait, is it Ikago controlling the, the firefly dude? I'm confused. Why, why is he there? I don't see Ikago. It must be him. I like Moro leading the charge, too. He sort of has established himself as the, the uncle of the group, father figure of the group. Knuckles the big brother. Shoot is the mom. Speaking of fanfics, it's called Full X House. <laughs> I wonder what it would have felt like watching this show if we only knew what the main characters knew going into this. And then later we uncovered the Kamugi thing. It's interesting watching them knowing what's going on because you're like, yeah, you wouldn't possibly know. This is going to be an unexpected event. I mean, there actually probably are going to be more unexpected events to us or me, the viewer. As I've mentioned, I think the writing basically establishing that really well, that things are going to happen. You got to sort of go along for the ride, which has been great so far. I do really like that that's covered. It's something I talked about a lot in shows, but it's rarely substantiated because it's written. It's hard to write in randomness into scripted things. You have like a goal you want to reach, right? But it matches my experience. A lot of times the things I anticipated being the, the best things to happen to me ended up being not great. Some of the things I was really dreading turned out to be wonderful in ways I never could have expected, all due to these intangible elements that I couldn't have foreseen. Dream jobs have been awful. Terrible jobs have been wonderful, as one example. I think it's easy to sink in with Clue's energy because it is a pretty solid rule to expect the unexpected, which doesn't mean you don't think about things, you don't strategize and plan. You always have to have like one in place, but you don't want to get married to it and reject new inputs informationally. But also that your gut can be a really powerful thing. They are going to be undone and it might end up being Lua that is doing the damage control on that front. This felt like a little bit of an in-between episode. It's kind of torture in a good way because God, we've been agonizing, hanging over this cliff for so long. This final encounter where, yeah, we've seen the king make great progress and strides, but it's the king and the royal guards. They will kill you. It's likely that a lot of these characters are not going to make it out of this. They're all over the place mentally. There are so many things they don't know. And I guess I don't know. It just feels like it's going to be a frenzied free-for-all.